minutes worth in on this men's fellowship thing, you know. Uh, this, this, you find this happen in a lot of churches. Go to the prayer meetings, okay? And who's there? Ladies, right? I, I think uh, last night's prayer meeting, uh, uh, we kind of split it between prayer and teaching. But I was the only man there, I think. I don't think there was, were any other men. Did you come? Yeah, okay. So the two of us were the only men there. If you look at the, the people that give of their time to the church, okay, those that come to the prayer meetings, those that, uh, you know, are here on church cleanup day, those that just stop by because the Lord put it on their heart to pull some weeds out or whatever, 80% 80, 80 of the time it's, it's the ladies. And guys, you know, when we get home, we want to say, well, bless God, I'm the man in this household. Well, if you're the man in this household, start leading by example. Now, was that too subtle, brother? Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I have a friend who unfortunately is Baptist, um, but <laughs> he hasn't seen the light yet. But, but uh, you know, uh, he, we were talking about, you know, what had happened in church last week or something, and I said, yeah, you know, praise God, we, we baptized, you know, two people on, on Sunday. He said, and, and I said, you know, we've baptized however many it was, you know, so many for the year. And, man, I'm really, I'm really happy about that, you know. And he says, yeah, how many of them were men? See, it happens to the Baptists too. So, all right, all right. Now, now that you're all nice and mad at me, <laughs> praise God. Um, on Wednesday nights for a while here, we're, we're going to study our way through the book of Romans. For those of you that have not been here uh, on uh, Wednesday nights with us as we started this. There's a few reasons for this. One is it, is it just keeps us honest, okay? It forces us to talk about everything that's in the scripture and not just pick our favorite parts. You know, that, that's, that's where a lot of church denominations get into trouble, right? Because they pick, pick their favorite parts of the Bible and they think it's like going to first cafeteria, you know? Well, let's see, I want mercy and I want a little grace and oh, I'll take some heaven. I'll, I'll take a double helping of heaven. But repentance, I don't want any of that stuff. Baptism, no, nah, no, nah, just a little dabble. Do I don't really need, right? And, and, and they pick and choose what they're going to teach, what they're going to practice, okay? And so by doing the, the, taking the discipline on, I guess, of going through a book of the Bible, it forces us to look at the full counsel of God, and it keeps us on the path. It keeps us from straying too far on this side or too far on that side. You know, it's like an old Bible teacher of mine used to say, you know, well, you know, if you go too far over this way, there's the ditch. But be careful, because if you go too far over this way, there's a ditch over there too, right? Now, I'm not saying you can go too far in worshiping Jesus, because you can never go too far in worshiping and serving him, right? Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, there are a couple people heard that. Is this thing on? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the, the, one of the reasons for Romans, though, is that Romans lays out the Christian doctrine in, in, a, in a systematic way. Um, some of the other epistles, uh, you know, there's troubleshooting. There's a problem in the church and Paul's writing about the problem in the church or whatever. But in Romans and in Hebrews, we get a very systematic approach and that helps to root us and ground us and helps to establish us in the faith. Okay, so we're up to Romans chapter 8. And believe it or not, we're only going to cover two verses tonight. Um, but we're going to cover those, ver we're only going to cover the two verses because Paul manages to pack a lot of material into these two verses. So Romans 8.22, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, okay? So there's some key concepts that he brings up here. He brings up the idea of, of birth pangs, right? The, 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 the labor pains that, that, a, that a woman has as she's getting ready to bring forth a baby, okay? And some points that you might not know, gentlemen, but you know, they tell me that labor is painful, right? That's why they call it birth pangs. It's a painful thing. Okay? And, and so 
there, there, is, there is this pain that, that you go through in giving birth to a child. Now hang on to that idea, okay? That pain, though, produces a new life, okay? So at the moment, for, for just 8, 10, 12, 24 hours, right? I, our first was 24 and a half hours. Ooh, right? But for a relatively short period of time, you have this pain, but then you're rewarded with a brand new life. And that's exactly what happens with us. That's exactly what is happening with the church. You'll understand this a little bit better as we go on through this, okay? But this is exactly what is happening, okay? Jesus is bringing something to birth, bringing something, some new life into the world. Well, bless God, I thought I was already born again. Well, wait a minute, there's a little bit more, okay? Now, birth pangs are also of an uncertain duration. You don't know how long they're going to last, right? Some ladies will, will, will start having birth pangs, you know, and, and, and it's another two weeks before they have the baby, right? So, and, and so you just don't know when those birth pangs start, right? That's why they say, you know, when the birth pangs start, stay close to home, right? Or stay close to the hospital, right? Because you just don't know how long that's going to go on before that baby comes out, right? Hmm. Is this sounding familiar? Now, we know Jesus is coming back, right? We know that that's going to happen, and that's, a, that's as sure, that's more sure. That is more sure than knowing that the sun is going to come up in the morning, okay? Jesus will come back, and we have this sense that maybe the birth pangs are starting, right? We're starting to see some things out there in the world that kind of look like maybe things are starting to happen, right? And you know what? There's, there's uh, persecution that's starting, and, and it's start. well, it's not starting in the rest of the world. It's been happening out there for a long time, but it's starting to happen in our country. Right? There, there, there are wars and rumors of wars, right? There, there's all kinds of funny things happening. And this might be those birth pangs that are starting, right? But guess what? We don't know how long it's going to take, okay? And you know, uh, when, now I, I, was, I, was, I was swept in with the, um, the, the, the charismatic revival, I guess they called it, that, that happened in, in the 70s, okay? And, and at the time, many people had just rediscovered the fact that Jesus is going to return. You know, those old cold dead churches, which is about 90% of them, right? They, they, they don't even talk about Jesus' second coming, right? Because they've long since for, uh, ceased to believe what's in the scriptures, okay? They want to teach social justice, which is wonderful. I'm all in favor of social justice, right? They, they, they want to teach love thy neighbor, and I'm all in favor of loving your neighbor. Well, in the right context of loving your neighbor, right? But, but, but they, they, don't, they don't want to teach about repentance. They don't want to teach about baptism. They don't want to teach about receiving the Holy Ghost. And for sure, they don't want to talk about Jesus coming again to take stock, right? Right? Oh, glory to God. And so many people in the, in the 70s were, were swept in with this, this charismatic, and charismatic is just Pentecostal light, you know. Uh, I mean, it, it, charismatic is Pentecostal for people that have like PhDs or something. Yeah, yeah okay, right? And, and, and people got excited because they learned that Jesus was coming again. And they thought because they just learned it that it was going to happen day after tomorrow. Right? And there's people just walking around, oh, hallelujah, glory to God. I don't, I'm not going to mow my grass because Jesus will come before I even need to do that. Right? And everybody was, was so excited about it. But, but understand, we have to be in it for the long haul. Okay? Now, it may be very quickly, but you know what? He could tarry for a number of years longer. And what happened in the 70s is a lot of people got, got, got all excited and they got all hepped up. And then when it didn't happen after about four or five years, they ran out of steam. Right? They wore themselves out. Okay? So we've got to be in it for the long haul. And if, and, and if it happens sooner, wonderful. But you know what? You've got to be willing to live for him for the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's of uncertain duration. Now get this. You tolerate. Now, you, you know, I, I used to wonder. Because I'd hear horror stories about, you know, how painful labor was, right? I used to wonder. 
man, if it hurts that much, how come people have more than one kid? Right? 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 You know, it's painful. Right? You tolerate the birth pains because of the hope. Right? You tolerate that, that, that pain. Do you need a, a tissue, sweetie? Here. Here you go. You, you tolerate that pain because of the hope that is set before you. It says Jesus, right? Jesus suffered, right? But he suffered because he was looking forward to the hope that would come. That hope was not just his resurrection. That hope was us, okay? That hope was bringing many children into the family, okay? When he came, he was the only begotten son of God. But he's not the only begotten son of God anymore, right? He brought, he will bring many sons and daughters, okay? So we are in the process of a birth, guys. Jesus is giving birth to something, and it may be quicker, and it may be slower, but it will be painful, but it will be worth the pain. Now this is a message that Paul gives over and over again to almost every church that he writes to. You know, be, be steadfast. Just stand. Don't, you know, having done all the stand, just keep standing. It's worth it. It's worth it. Praise God. Okay. Romans 8, 24, 25. He says, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Well, now that makes sense, right? I, I mean, you know, sometimes we think we have to, to kind of check our brains at the door when we come into church. But this is just common sense, right? You're not going to hope for something that you already have. Man, I'm, I'm hoping for a corduroy sport coat. Man, I'm really hoping for a gray corduroy sport coat, right? You think I was crazy because I'm wearing one, right? Right? Yes? Right? So you only hope for what you don't have. Right? You know, you hope for those things that, that you don't have. Now, hope, the, the word in the Greek is elpis, and, and it's not like wishy-washy like we talk about hope, you know? People talk about, well, you know, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket, and I hope I win the lottery. No, you don't. You wish you win the lottery, but you really have no hope of winning the lottery because the odds are one in a hundred million or something, right? And, and, and that word elpis is, is not just, you know, I wish I had it, right? But, but it is, I know I'm getting it someday. I just don't know what day it's coming, okay? I know that I will be resurrected someday. I just don't know what that day is. I know that Jesus is coming for his church someday. I just don't know what that day is, but you know what? I'm going to hang on till that day comes. Oh, he says if we hope for what we do, do not see, we eagerly await it with what? Perseverance. Perseverance. Hang in there. Stick with it, right? Okay, and, and, and I'll tell you what. We have raised in this country a bunch of Christian babies. And, you know, some of that's on purpose. Because there's a lot of pastors that don't really want their congregations to grow very much spiritually. They want to keep them dependent, right? And so, you know, you would think it was really weird, right? If, if, if you know, I had my 22-year-old son here, and he was still in diapers, and I was still feeding him a bottle, and right? You know, you go, what's wrong with you as a parent? that you didn't teach your child to, to use the restroom and you didn't teach your child to eat solid food, right? But a lot of pastors will keep their congregations in the dark so they keep them dependent upon them so that you have to stay with me because you need me, Be, right? No, no, that's not what John Michael's about. That's not what I'm about, right? We're about growing you so that you can feed yourself. Come on, come on, woo! And one of the things you get when you grow up is perseverance, stick to itiveness. You know, you stick with it. Those, those were the lessons that we were supposed to learn in sports, right? You know, now today the lesson we learn in sports is, you know, you got to use steroids and you got to, you know, whatever, right? No, the lesson you're supposed to learn in sports or in music, uh, you know, uh, it's a, I, I was in the band, they, they used to call us band Twinkies, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid. But one of the great lessons is, you know, you, you start at the beginning of the year and you, you can barely make a noise, right? And by the end of the year, man, you can play Frere Jaca, Frere Jaca, right? Whatever. 
right? You stick to it and, and, and you discipline yourself. Oh, does that sound like the word disciple? Yeah, a disciple is one who is disciplined. You stick to it and you discipline yourself and you fix your eye on the hope. You fix your eye on what it is that you want to become in Christ. And then you know what? When you stub your toe, it's no big deal. Oh, but we've, but we've raised a generation, no more than a generation, several generations of Christians that just, oh, I just like it. I can't follow Jesus anymore. I just, I've given up on the whole thing. You know, I mean, I was sick for two days and the pastor didn't even come and pray for me. Well, maybe you ought to grow up and learn how to pray for yourself. Come on. I mean, we're happy to pray for you, but come on. Yes, we got to learn to take care of ourselves. We got to grow up. Jojo, what do you need, sweetie? Come on. No. Okay, here. You want to take a box? Take it over to your dad, though, okay? No, no, take it to your dad. Take, take it to your dad so he can have it. There you go. That way, that way dad can hold on to it. Praise God. Okay, so, so we, we have this hope, okay, and we are, we are someplace in the process of birth pains, and it hurts. Guys, it, you know, get it through your head. It hurts sometimes to be a Christian, okay? It hurts sometimes to be a Christian. It hurts when your friends don't want to be your friends anymore, because you're some kind of Jesus freak. What's the matter with you? You didn't used to. You didn't used to be this way. Man, you used to come drinking with us. You, you know, all right. Remember when we shot out so and so's windows? Or you know, right? Yeah. Huh? Uh, no, they don't want to be your friends anymore. That's okay. That's okay. You don't need friends like that because they'll pull you right back down to where you started from, huh? Sometimes it hurts to be a Christian. In in most of the world today. Christians every day are dying for no other reason than that they are Christians. And I could tell you some horror stories, but I don't want to because, one, because we've got youngsters in the room, and, and, and two, because it's, it's, it's sad. It's too sad. But all over the world, Christians have to choose. Do I want Jesus or do I want death? Okay? Um, there are many um, people in the Muslim world that when they come to faith in Christ, they have to have the baptism in secret. Because if the city or if the authorities find out that you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, right, they'll kill you. Because it's illegal. And it's the, the death penalty to convert and to become a Christian, right? And yet we're sitting here and if the padding isn't thick enough in our chairs, we think we're suffering, you know? Come on, come on. Praise God. Okay, so, so this is the idea of, of birth pains. Okay, let's pick up another idea. Okay, he talks about the first fruits of the Spirit. He says we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, that first word in first fruits ought to give you some idea. They're what come first. Now, if something comes first, then something else comes next. Huh? And, and so the Holy Ghost, right, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit is just the beginning. Right? He says that's just the first fruits. That's just what you get initially. I don't know if any of you ever grow a garden, right? But, but uh, when, you, when you grow tomatoes, right? I mean, initially you might go out there and there'll be one or two tomatoes. There's not too many tomatoes. But you go back a couple of weeks later and there'll be two, three, four dozen tomatoes on your tomato plants, right? The first fruits are just a little tiny taste of what is coming in the future. Okay, and, and that's what we, one, if you, if you haven't received the first fruits, uh, if you haven't received the first fruits of the Spirit, you need to, okay? And, 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 and the Bible knows no such thing as a Christian who's not received the Holy Ghost. And the Bible knows no such thing as a Christian who has not received the Holy Ghost in the miraculous way in which the Holy Ghost was imparted in the book of Acts. Praise God, okay? And if you haven't done that, you need to do that. But for those of us that have, please understand, that's just a little tiny preview. It's just a little preview. So don't think, oh, oh, I made it, I got it all. No, no, there's much more to come. 2 Corinthians 121. Now he which, which establishes, uh, establisheth it, us, establishes us. Now he which establishes us, with you in Christ and has anointed us is God 
who also has sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay, and, and, I, and I use the King James there instead of the New King James because the King James is more word literate. And I wanted you to see that, that word, the earnest, the earnest of the Spirit. You know, if you buy a house, you put a down payment on the house, they call that earnest money, okay? You, 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 you look at the house and you say, yes, I want to buy this house. Look, I'm going to give you $1,000 now, okay? And then I'm going to go talk to my banker and we'll get you the rest later, right? It's a small down payment on what you're going to do in the future, right? So, let's see. If, no, I didn't put it on there. Okay. I forget what I put on the notes and what I don't put on the notes. It's, it's, it's just a little bit, right? It might be 1%. It might be a fraction of a percent of ultimately what you're going to pay for the house. Okay? That's what we got when we got the Holy Spirit. He says, I've marked you. You're mine. Right? I've got my mark on you. I've set you apart. You belong to me. And I'm coming back for you. Yes. 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 Come on. Come on. It is the earnest. It is God saying, I'm going to give you a deposit. The Holy Ghost is your deposit on heaven. The Holy Ghost is your deposit on heaven. Come on. How do you know you're His? Well, He gave you His Spirit. He's coming back for you. Praise God. Then He talks, he talks about waiting for the adoption. Okay? We're waiting for something. Right? And, and this is going to get back to the birth pains. All right? We're waiting for adoption. So what is the adoption? Not adoption in general, but what is the adoption that we're waiting for? Go ahead. Okay, okay. You're, 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 yes, generically, generically you're there, right? More specifically, right? The resurrection. Okay, and that, and, and, and you're, you're, you're going in the right neighborhood there. Romans 8, 23, he said, not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Okay, so at the adoption, right, we will see our bodies redeemed. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. John, 1 John 3, 2. He says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Right? But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Okay? The adoption happens at, uh, at the resurrection. Right? And John says, yes, we're the children of God now. But I'll tell you what, we don't know how, and, and certainly the world doesn't know, and creation doesn't know exactly what we will be. They can't see it yet. God can see it. The, the angels are waiting. The angels are looking. The angels are watching us. And they're saying, man, I know God's got a plan. I know God's got a plan for those little mud balls. Boy, let's just hang around and see what God does. Let's see what God does. Let's see God turn a drug addict into a pastor. Praise God. Let's see God turn a, a, a oh, glory to God. Come on. Yes. Yes. It does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we have hope. In other words, we have something that is coming in the future that we should be looking forward to. And the hope is the hope of adoption. Now we have the hope of being adopted. Okay? Romans 8.23, right? He says, for we were saved in this hope or saved by this hope. Okay? We have, and if you go into any church, in, 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 well, any, any church who claims to be um, evangelical and you ask how many people in here are saved, right? You'll have most of the people in the room raise their hands. Well, technically that's not true. Technically, what you have is a promise of salvation and the hope of salvation and a down payment on salvation, but you ain't got the whole meal deal yet. Thank God he's got more in store, okay? And, and this hope, well, let's, 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 let's read what John says first. 1 John 3, 2. He says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, so if I ask you, are you a child of God? Yeah. Now we are the children of God, 
and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now get the that last sentence. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. Okay? This, this hope should be a purifying hope. Okay? This hope that we have, right, should drive us to sanctification should drive us to live righteously, should drive us to live a life that is set aside and dedicated to God, right? And everyone who has this hope purifies himself, okay? There's some action that we need. Now, he will give us the power, but we need to have the will. He will give us the power to overcome, but we have to then use the power that he gives us. And so many people just sit at the altars, oh God, I need power, I need power. And all you have to do is put the thing in gear and step on it. You already got all the power you need. Use what he gives you. Come on, say amen. Praise God or say oh my, I don't care, right? And, 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 and you, if you have this hope, right, you are now working toward the goal of looking and sounding and acting just like Jesus, okay? And, and so ultimately, we will be purified just as he is pure. Oh, wait a minute, that's Jesus. Yeah. Didn't you, didn't, didn't you, ever, didn't you ever read the verse that says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things are new and all things are of God. Okay? You cannot purify yourself without his power, right? But you must make use of the power that he gives you to purify yourself. Okay? But you got to get this. Okay? And I know most people in here get this. Okay? But most people who claim to be Christians don't get this. Okay? This hope is conditional. This hope always comes with a two-letter word attached to it. If. Okay? Hebrews 3.6. He says, but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast. If we hold fast. The confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. It's not good enough. It's not good enough to come and have a wonderful Holy Ghost experience, right? And then go walk back and wander back to where we came from in the first place, right? Peter says that's like the old proverb, a dog returns to his vomit. And, and a pig that's cleaned up will just go right back and roll in the mud again. Huh? Come on. Come on. He says we are his house. We, in other words, we're his family, right? We are his family if we hold fast. And it's not good enough to hold fast until the next to the last day. You got to hold fast until the end. And God saw, glory to God, God says to Ezekiel twice, he says, you know, you're going to say that this is unfair, but you know what? If, if there's a man and he's uh, led, led a sinful life and, and, and toward the end of his life, he repents and he ceases from his sin, you know, all his sin's going to be forgiven and forgotten and he's going to enter into the kingdom. Oh, that sounds good. We like that. But then he says on the other sand, there might be a man that lived righteously his whole life. And he did really well until the last few, I'm, I'm paraphrasing of course, but until the last few weeks of his life and then he fell back and you know what? He ain't going to enter the kingdom. Oh, oh, he says, you're going to say that's not fair. And I'm going to say, no, I'm fair. You're not fair. We have to hang on to the end, okay? We have to hang on to the end. And that's why this race is not a sprint, it's a marathon. This race, we should need to be in it for the whole duration. We need to be in the race with our hearts, with our minds, with everything we have until the very end. Don't burn out. Don't burn out. Praise God. Go from victory to victory. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Now, he talks about something. He talks about the redemption of our body. 
okay? And I'm going to use this to introduce to you the three R's of Christianity, okay? You know, in school, sister, they have three R's, right? Read and write and arithmetic, right? Well, in the church, we have three R's, okay? And I'm not doing this just to be clever. It sounds clever, but, but this is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stretching anything to tell you this, okay? The first R is ransom. Okay? Jesus ransomed us. When did he ransom us? When he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood. Right? That was the ransom. Okay? Now, ransom there is the word lutron. And it is the price paid for the release of a captive. Okay? Or the price paid for the release of a slave. Now, now you know, very often, right, throughout history, um, they, they, the enemy will come in and will capture uh, you know, certain key people, right? And they'll take them back into their territory and then they'll ransom them back, right? Well, you know, uh, if you bring me a hundred gold coins, I'll give you your king back, right? You, you know the, the story about the child kidnapping, right? I mean, the, the MO is, is like, you know, they, they kidnap the kid, they write a note, you know, and they say, yeah, bring a hundred thousand dollars, put it in a briefcase, leave it under a park bench, and we'll release your son. That's the ransom, the price, okay? The price that is paid for the release of captives. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay? The life that he gave on the cross, you know, they didn't take it from him. Right? He could, he could have hung on that cross for a thousand years and not died. Right? He says, they don't take it from me, I give it freely. Right? That price that price was the ransom, okay? But then after the ransom, okay, comes redemption. Now, if, if, if we continue with the kidnapping story, right? They kidnap the kid. They say, put $100,000 in a briefcase, slide it under a park bench, right? Then when we get the $100,000, we're going to release your child, right? We're going to send your child back to you, right? Or, or in the movies, right, they always meet in some parking lot someplace, right? And, and, and the guys are on this side with their guns and they got the kid and the other guys are on this side with, with, with the money in a briefcase and they got their guns, right? And they walk into the middle and they trade off, right? Okay, the briefcase full of money then is, is the ransom, but releasing the kid is the redemption, right? It is apolutrosis. It's the release of the captives after the payment of a ransom, okay? Now, if you go to one of the pawn shops in town, right, and you take your grandma's squash blossom necklace or whatever, and, and you take it in and, and you, and you, you um, enter it into pawn, right, they'll, they'll give you some money, they'll give you a little ticket, right, and when you're ready to get that back, what do you do? You bring money back in, right, to buy that necklace back and then they give it to you and that's called redeeming your pawn, right? And, and so